We are on an adventure to find a cider press that is powered by a water wheel. Oh, looks like I might have gone too far. Dag nabbit. Okay, got to turn around. Hello, my name is Rhea Wincaller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. I hope you're doing well wherever you are right now, and stoked like I am to be entering season seven of Cider Chat. And this here episode number is 301. If you are new, you know, you got some good episodes to listen to and just peruse through, find a topic, learning how to make cider, uh, how to graft a, a tree because we're coming into the spring season coming up right now. This episode is going live in January. And before you know it, folks will be out pruning and grafting. And then we also have tips on, on Calvados. Uh, you know, the sky's the limit. There's endless stories all about cider, so many different techniques, so many different styles, and amazing, wonderful people. So you are in the right place, and it's even better if you have a little cup of cider to enjoy while you're at it. In fact, I'm going to have a little sip of mine right now. Excuse me. Oh, yeah. Mm. Mm. So good. Cider and podcasting go so well together. (laughs) I'm going to have a little bit more when I come back. I'm going to be telling you a little bit about our sponsors. Here's a fun little factoid to consider. In 2018, there was no New York International Cider Competition. In that year, ciders were entered into the New York International Beer Competition. Because Adam Levy, who was the founder, was just toying with the idea, seeing, are there enough cider makers interested in putting their products into a competition that are going to be judged by buyers and sellers of products? Not just folks who are, you know, highfalutin judges of cider, but people who actually go out and say, okay, this this one is going to make it on the shelf and people are going to dig it. And of course, to buy it at that price point. Well... In 2018, the Ciders played second fiddle, but I'll tell you, there were winners, and they won big time, not only for the medals that they got that year, but for Cider far and wide, because in 2019, Adam announced the New York International Cider Competition, and now, in 2022, it's in its fourth year running. It's coming right up in February of this year. All you need to do is go to N yiciderCompetition.com. On the top of the page, there's a little home page, an about page, event info, and a winners page. So it'll tell you all the past winners. And of course, all you need to do is just kind of scroll down the page and it'll say, submit your cider, learn more. So I'm going to click on that right now. It tells you how to enter general information, the deadline to have your ciders in is February 20th. So it's it's coming right up. I mean, this is the time to shine. Check it out at nyiciderCompetition.com. The American Cider Association invites you to their 12th annual CiderCon, a global cider conference for cider professionals. CiderCon is taking place February 1st through the 4th, 2022, in beautiful Richmond, Virginia, at the heart of a celebrated cider region. With tours, tasting, educational workshops, demos, and more, CiderCon's return to an in-person event is bound to be one of the most energetic CiderCons to date. With more than 30 sessions being offered, there's something for everyone. For instance, right now, there's an opportunity to sign up for the sessions Let's Make Trees, Apple Grafting Workshop. Almost all commercial fruit trees are grafted in order to make sure the fruit is consistent. Various rootstocks are hybridized in order to control size, help control diseases, and to better suit the tree to different locations. The desired variety is then attached to the rootstock to make the new tree. 
In this workshop, Mary Stickley Godinez will discuss the various methods by which trees are grafted, and then Raul Godinez will show you how to make your own tree to take home. This session is free, but there's only space for 45 people, so be sure to fill out the form after you register for CiderCon. Tickets to CiderCon are just $435 if you book by January 20th. To learn more about the wide array of events, and educational sessions being offered and to register for CiderCon, head to the American Cider Association's website today. CiderCon is an ACA member event produced with the generous support of members and sponsors. Learn how to become an ACA member or sponsor today by going to ciderassociation.org. Well, it's time now, Ciderville, to go to our water wheel story. Oh my goodness, I can't even tell you how how kind of like parallel universe this was. First of all, this cider wheel is located pretty close to where I live. Just, you know, not even 30 minutes away. And you'll hear that it was built about 11 years ago. So it's been around, right? And I didn't hear about it. I mean, I'm kind of like in cider central territory, no doubt. And even more interestingly, the actual press itself was built by the same guy, Phil Watson, who built the water wheel and the whole cider house. He scavenged parts for the cider press really close to my home. Like, like, I don't know, through the woods, less than a mile. That was really neat. And then where he lived as a kid also happens to be a little village by the name of Cushman Village on the north edge of Amherst, a place that I have friends who live right around there. And I had no idea until I met Phil Watson that there was a cider mill, a water-powered cider mill in that area. Super fascinating. Or even that, you know, there was a cider press out in the woods, not too far from where I live. Now, maybe if you think about New England, it wouldn't be too surprising. But the fact that those stories hadn't revolved back to me as someone who, you know, writes about beer for this area and is like a total cider geek, I just love that. I mean, how cool is that? And I hope that that kind of inspires you too to keep on reaching out into your communities. Uh, We're going to be coming up with an episode soon on Cider Mills coming right up in Michigan And nobody really knew the full story until Patrick McCauley, who's going to be the guest on that particular episode, started researching it. So there are stories yet to be discovered, and that is the beauty of being part of Cider Chat for me and meeting someone like Phil Watson, because it was, it was really, it was flooring me. I couldn't believe it. And also makes me kind of think, what else is there to discover? So we begin by getting in his car and driving to the location where the cider mill is. And just to know a little bit about Phil, he has a sawmill. And that sawmill was really the key tool that provided the resource of amazing wood to build this cider house, right? You can't have one without the other, really, when you think about it. And even back in the day, I'm sure folks who are building their own water wheels, as they did in Cushman Village, probably had an on-site sawmill to some extent. Because what is true, at least in my area, and actually right where I live, there used to be a water-powered sawmill right here. (laughs) <laughs> right across the street, and the stream goes right through my land here. And the stories are pretty amazing. The cool thing about this particular sawmill that was where I live, it was owned by a woman, and that was really unheard of at that time. But that's another story for another day. Now we're going to head out with Phil Watson. He has a little label for the cider that he makes, and uh, there'll be a photo of his uh, label that he uses on the bottle calls it the snake cider company and i love this little slogan it says don't eat the apple drink the snake guaranteed pure snake <laughs> so i'll give you a sense of phil i adore this guy we're going to be riding up to the cider mill 
and heading there now. I'm a person who's been plagued by curiosity all my life as well. And when I was young, my brother and sister and I, my mother was a single mom, and she bought an old cider farm in um, Cushman. And in the back of the, uh, the farm, there was, you know, obviously apple trees, but a lot of the trees had been taken down. It was old. And the back of the farm was a, uh, a building that was somewhat falling in, but it was still standing. And it was three stories tall, and it was built on the side of a bank. And there was a pond below it. Um, and the apples would be brought in by a wagon at the very top and dumped into a grinder. And then the grinder would go down to the next level, which would be the press. Mm -hmm. And then the press would squeeze and the uh, juices would flow into the basement where there were these large, um, I mean, very large casks, open casks that would get this cider. And then from the casks, they would pour them into, um, draw it off into wooden barrels. Mm -hmm. And um, Fantastic. So this whole thing, I don't know, it might have been, you know, it might have been steam powered. It might have been powered by a horse-drawn treadmill, but it was quite old when we got there, and that was in the 1950s. So... Uh, later came to discover that across the street from us, uh, uh, there was another farmhouse, and in the basement of that farmhouse were these racks that uh, could hold wooden barrels of cider, and underneath each rack where the cider barrel would have gone was the name of a family in the area, you'd assume. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I assume that all these people, you know, had a vested interest in their cider, which would of course been hard cider, mm -hmm. which is why I call it a drunkard's dream. Because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> New England, making stuff yourself and not having to spend any money to have right? it is a big thing. Right? Maybe it's it? everywhere, but I know it from here. <laughs> well, that's that, that's that line from the song, a drunkard's dream, if I ever did see yeah, one. Right. I know, they're a dear, great dear, band. Dear. They were a yeah. great, great <laughs> band. The yeah. band. Yeah. <clears throat> well, anyway, so that's, that's where... I got this idea, and then of course, uh, oh, wow. my mother decided that the thing was too dangerous for my brother to be crawling around in it with me, and so she had it torn down, which mm. was really disappointing because mm. it was so fascinating mm. how everything was put together, and um, mm. and uh, they had these giant wooden screws that had been replaced by giant metal screws, and I mean like sixes in diameter and eight feet tall, wow. that would be kind of like a ship's capstan, you know, they would, mm -hmm. they would have these poles, they would walk around and around and tighten these clamps on mm -hmm. these giant press. So, um, there was all kinds of neat things in there that we never got to fully explore. But anyway, on my bucket list, I had this idea that I might want to build a cider mill someday, and I decided I wanted to sort of model it like this mill that I remembered. It's a lot smaller, but, so it's basically three stories, and. Oh, the smaller in. three stories come well, on it's, now it's not very big it's small but it's three yeah. stories but yeah. so you bring the apples into the top and they're ground and then they fall through the floor uh press to the press and then the press squeezes them and then in the basement there's some uh tanks to collect the cider and uh i think we've been running this mill for maybe 11 years or something so you built it years. you finished it about 11 years ago yeah uh -huh. yeah and it was kind of a lark, you know, we just wanted to see if we could do it. And then I've always been really fascinated by water power. Mm -hmm. And there was this little brook there, which doesn't flow very much year round, unfortunately. And yeah, we're on the opposite side of the road where there was a pretty yeah, steady stream coming down, but we're, that's not the same one. Well, there's water this year. Like this was the first year we could have actually run something uh -huh. with the wheel, but um, I think next year, if it looks like it's going to be wet again, I might try to hook it up to at least the press. Because mm -hmm. you'll see that in there, there's a press that runs by either a bicycle or electric motor. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, that's what it is. All right, there you have it, Ciderville. The cider house that he built is about 10 by 10, but it's kind of like a, a tall tower. And we were 
getting there on this like little back wood road because you do not see this cider house. It is like hidden in the woods, which is really cool in my mind. I like that. And as you pull up to it, you go up to the ramp that leads to the top floor. So it's kind of like that style of a barn. You know, there's one level that you could go to the top floor and then there's another driveway that will bring you down to the bottom level where the juice eventually makes its way after being pressed. And on the side, <laughs> coming up to it, was the wheel. And just to back up a little bit for all our European friends and Canadian friends, 10 by 10 is about 3 meters by 3 meters. And the wooden wheel was 14 feet in diameter or 4 meters in diameter. Kind of kind of pretty righteous looking wheel. And of course, I'm going to have little video clips of this and photos, but just kind of bear that in mind. It's it's a, definitely a backwoods cider house, but it has so much spirit. And there's the wheel is made out of wood. Yeah, it's made out of wood. Because you got a lumber mill, so you can... I got a lumber mill, so we hey, have to man. make one. No <laughs> kidding. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah, and it's all, all that, that entire wheel is made out of the white oak from one white oak tree. And of course, I've never built a white water wheel before. And um, the one thing I learned building this one water wheel, which is about 16 feet in diameter, is that I don't know anything about building water wheels. And there's a oh, lot you more do to now. It than I ever thought. <laughs> I bet. No kidding. Um, but it does make a really wonderful sound when it goes around and this water comes off oh, and it goes yeah. and hopefully if it's not kind of as it's throwing out the water yeah, the if it's not if it's not uh, frozen in today we'll start it right up look at that fantastic All right. so in case you're wondering the wheel was not spinning when we arrived because that wouldn't really be safe and you want to be able to control that. I mean, imagine if there was like a big downpour and all of a sudden this wheel's like spinning out of control. I mean, shoot, that, that could be pretty darn dangerous. So when it's not in use, it's just standing still. And the way that Phil gets the water wheel to move is super simple. There's this little spit of a stream coming down the hill. It goes underneath the road that we're parked on. And there's like a, a corrugated plastic pipe. Uh, a, a culvert, if you will. He just takes some metal sheathing from like a roof and tucks it underneath that water that's squirting out of that little pipe there. And it goes on the metal sheathing. And this is what you're hearing him do right now. He's getting it situated. And the water starts going down this track. It goes down the metal and down this flue. There she goes. So you got it on a bit of a, a tilt there. Yeah, a little bit of a tilt. Just enough to kind of, doesn't matter if there's leaves there, they just kind of no, go on down. Work their way just down. a little bit of water wow. was all it took. And this was really also cool. a wooden flue. It's got a I think there's a loose joint in there. I got to do some repair on it, but we had it running while we were pressing this year. So I'm kind of curious on the building of the water wheel. It looks like you have uh, one by. Two layers yeah. of white oak um, that are sandwiched together. There's each rib. Oh, there it goes. It's turning. It's starting to go. We can go over here. Yeah. See. Each rib that um, Look is, at that. is bolted into the side walls oh, of these two layers. So there, oh, it's not quite. Oh, oh, well, it sucks. It might have some ice in it. But now it's going backwards. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, is it okay to like walk up oh, here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So it did continue going. First it went a little bit backwards, and then before you know it, that water wheel started turning. Yeah, that is cool. I mean, that's a lot of velocity there. Yeah. It's just, this has made my day. I can't believe it. <laughs> I did put a pipe up in there to get some water so oh, we can, yeah. mostly so I can wash things out. And then I disconnected it so it just runs free, otherwise it'll freeze up. Does this stream have a name? I don't think so. It it's, looks on, like it's, on, it's on the old topographical maps, so the geological survey maps. But it's really uh, a seasonal, I mean, it usually is dry. 
Yeah, it looks like there was some kind of like stonework there a little bit, or maybe it's just kind of the that's natural That's completely stonework. natural. Yeah, that's completely natural. We haven't touched anything. So is this property that we're on right now what you log for your mill? Yeah, this is part of my operation. And is this what you you do as your well, primary enterprise? Well, I used to be a builder, and I tried to... I had a mill all my life, and I used to be a builder, and I tried to... Well, that's another story. I mean... Where, where I grew up on this apple farm, down the road there jacket. was a down the road there was a man who had a, two sawmills. Uh -huh. Of course, as a kid, I used to hang around there, and he had he had basically an inside sawmill and an outside sawmill. And okay. in the rainy days, in the wintry days, he would work on the inside mill. And then, when the sun was out and it was nice weather, he would work on the outside mill. It didn't have any roof or anything. They were both exactly the same. And <laughs> gee, man, that's enterprising. It really, I, uh, I can never forget that. That's, was, a, just, that's outstanding. What was that guy's name? His name was Chester Pratt. Chester Pratt. And there was a he had a little old he had a little old uh, shack that his his hired guy helped live with lived in and then he lived in another sort of slightly larger shack with his wife. I think he had some children, but when I came along um, they, they, there were no children, but anyway, I was. So, so was that was, Pratt Pratt Road that went up into Shutesbury? The was same fam family, same but family. It's, and it's near that. No kidding. But it wasn't on that road. But it was okay. the same family. Old. Oh, I love that. It's just like old Shutesbury family. No yeah. kidding. So and, um, I, I'm still trying to figure out, like, so you grew up in Cushman Village, and and the stream that that mill was on. Was that like the, it's a mill? The, oh, the, 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 the cider mill that we yeah, saw? Yeah, yeah. Well, there wasn't actually a stream there. It was just, a, it was like a pond. A pond. It must still be there. It's still there. It's, it's out um, behind this, what I call the Alp Farm, and there's a development now out there. What's it? It's not, I can't remember the name of it. But anyway, it's right on the top of Flat Hills Road. Flat Hills Road, okay. And there's a little pond yeah. out there. And the, I think the pond was... Maybe man-made or man-encouraged, and I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the thing was run by a steam, a little steam engine. Okay, that would make sense. Yeah, but it also could have been run by a by a horse-drawn treadmill, which was quite common. But they had to have some form of power because the, the grinding head for the, for the apples was, about maybe twelve inches in diameter and maybe a foot and a half or two feet long, and it was made out of solid wood and it spun. And they had driven nails in it. These little rusty nails were all, it was all full of nails sticking out like a porcupine. <laughs> That's what your mom was scared about. <laughs> yeah. And then the apples Rightly would just so. get smooshed up there, you know? Right. And uh, Jeez, so they had to spin that. Yeah. It's the only thing they had to spin. The rest was all done by hand. Yeah, the press itself. I I was, yeah, this is what I'm kind of, I want, you know, we'll go down and look at it, but I'm trying to understand the mechanics here. So you have the water wheel turning that turns it's basically the 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 grinder or scratcher that it's yeah. it's, it's doing and then the actual press you have inside is all hand cranked and you're putting well, it into baskets or it could be if you ran the bicycle but we also now i put an electric motor on it and i run a little generator here so if people don't want to pedal the bicycle which is more often than not then we'll just run the generator and have the electric motor run the little hydraulic pump right. that runs the press. Maybe a little electric bike now. They're they're coming online know, so quickly. Know, it's like know, just hook one of those suckers yeah, up. Yeah, I know. I know. Electric bike would be great. I know, and they, they're kind of like the. It's the same idea, you know. You take it, you take yeah. the energy from the sun, charge the batteries, right. and you know make the bike work. I yeah. love that. I, yeah. I just think that this is so cool. It's kind of like a childhood, yeah, memory. You know, actualized into like your adult yeah, self like what an amazing kind of bucket list to do and this is really cool phil i mean i oh. haven't seen anything like this <laughs> and well I'm, i you know i have fantasies about improving the wheel making it bigger and and uh but we'll see well it's 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 doing what it needs to do right yeah, now you know you kind of get so. it going yeah we make a lot of cider i mean it's uh the way this is set up right now we can make about 20 gallons of pressing and we can do four or five pressings an hour maybe that's more. pretty darn good yeah that's pretty good that's and and so and the, the problem that we're having is uh it's not really a problem is that 
people like to come and help, but nobody wants to take the cider. Or very few people take the cider. And mostly really? the huh. cider is good for either boiling it into cider syrup or making hard cider. Yeah. Which yeah, is yeah. what we make. We make right, hard right, cider. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's... Well, it's, you have a new member of your okay, good. team. I'm going to give you some... I'm going to give you some... Well, actually... We could, I, I brought a cider, too, for you. Okay, I want to I show you our, um, our label. <laughs> All right. This is our label. Oh, my goodness. It's called the Snake Cider Company. All right. That is cool. And it looks don't, like a little rattler. It's a little rattler. And wow. uh, don't eat the apple, drink snake. Don't eat the Guaranteed pure snake. All right. Now, mind you, Ciderville, he does not have a commercial snake. operation. This is just for the love of cider and that good old childhood memory growing up with a cider press right on his land as a kid. From there, we headed into the cider house and we're walking up into the third level. Oh yeah, this is pretty sturdy. We got a good little catwalk here. So oh, here we go. Just, yeah. This is a leaf mulcher somebody gave me. A leaf and, mulcher. Yeah, yeah. And, and we ran a we ran a we use a motor for it, and it has these little it has these little arms that fling about, and they, mm -hmm. it's basically a flail yeah. flail chipper. Perfect. Okay. And so then there's a lot of yelling and screaming back and forth about. Whoa! Stop! <laughs> is this pretty noisy here? This that thing? that that thing's a little noisy. Yeah, oh, it would be really nice to this. get rid of that. So we got a little steps going down little here. Steps going down. All right. We got a mouse there, dog. Okay, one one step. You want to go first? Go, go ahead, you buddy. You can't go barging down in front of the people. <laughs> what do you think you are? That what do you mean? Of course I can. So tell me about these stairs. Am I walking on one piece of? Yeah. A tree that's you all cut. On one piece of Holy tree. smokes. <laughs> you know, the thing Holy about a sawmill is it allows you to use some things that... No kidding. That is beautiful. Is this all oak here? Yeah, this is... Well, this is a big piece of pine. Big pine okay, tree. pine. Oh, my goodness. I'm just kind of curious. What's the diameter of the pine that you use to do something like that? Uh, it's probably uh, three feet, maybe. Yeah. Because I got two of them out of one. Wow. There's another one down there. So you just made kind of like uh, the other side became the... Yeah, so we cut it in half of the sawmill and then used the chainsaw to make the steps. Yeah, very cool. All right, yeah, so here you have like a rack and... Uh, so basically the apples will drop down here and there's a canvas that hangs here. And then um, you, uh, you, uh -huh. you put a canvas here and then there's a... There's a so you put the canvas in there. Never mind just having a water wheel. The guy is making stairways out of... A, a single tree. Unbelievable. That was just beautiful to look at. You got to check out the photo. And then what he has at the second floor is a classic rack and cloth press. But mind you, the wheels he scavenged from an old press that was out in the woods, and that was all he had were seven wheels. There were supposed to be eight wheels, but he just had seven. Figured it out and put it together and has a bomber of a press. Really something to behold. Maybe a little bit. Now, usually we bring it up to about 15 or 1600 pounds per square inch and hold it there for a while and then take it back down and then we unload the mash, the dried mash, out onto the roof. It just slides right down. Yeah, we just leave it out there and I pick it up later, Here. put it out for the wild animals. So then, you know, you just keep going back and forth. You roll it back, make another load, roll it out. And we do, you know, five or six of those loads an hour. And, uh... Fantastic. Wow. Yeah. Holy smokes. And so if you wanted to, you could sit on this bicycle and pedal the bicycle. And you can see the hydraulic pump turning. Oh, yeah. And it's a workout. This is the hydraulic pump right here. Okay. And so oh, the wheel, okay. the wheel is running a belt that yeah. runs around that. Yeah. <coughs> And the nature of a hydraulic pump is it's pumping fluid and nothing's really happening to that fluid unless you press this lever and then it diverts the fluid into the cylinder, which is creating the pressure. I see. So you're kind of working off of your, your primary press here, the hydraulics that you already have here. Yeah. Why not? Wow. Ingenuity. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> wow, man. I'm blown away. This is like, I'm like in Willy Wonka, happy 
Apple factory. So cool to be standing here and seeing it going around. Yeah, it really is. I... From the side of press room, we walked down the stairwell again on the second half of that pine tree that was made into stairs, <laughs> no less, down to the lowest level where they are collecting the juice. Here are the tubes. And we usually have a tank here, but I've got the tank at the house. These tubes come down from the rack and press up above. That's correct. And, uh, and Phil's then holding two tubes. The tank, and then you can draw off the tank, or I've got this, uh, this trough here that we hang like in a... this strap and it goes to that tank. Okay. And then I just leave these tubes in that trough and then they just fill up that tank, which is an old milk tank. Yeah, little milk tank right here. Little but the tank. good use looks like 150 gallons yeah, or something it is like about that. 150 gallons. We have a little road here that comes up on the lower side of the cider. What do you call it? The cider mill. I call it, yeah, cider mill or drunkard's dream, whatever you Drunkard's want. dream, yeah, I'll go with that. So you're, you're pulling it down and you're putting it in your carboys, you're like yes. five gallon carboys, right. bringing it home, yeah. putting it in the cellar. Yeah. And are you doing like a wild ferment or are you throwing in like yeast? Uh, it depends. I've used different yeasts and everything. This year I'm doing a wild ferment. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also using, I'm introducing honey. Yeah, nice. And I don't know, I'm sure that's controversial, but um, nah. I like my cider to have more than 5.5% alcohol. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. <laughs> I like it to be up around nine. Mm -hmm. But my cider tends to be not so dry for the first six months or so, and then come around the fall, it starts to get dry. And that's when it's really good. Yeah, it's still um, fermenting out, it sounds like. It You're takes still, a while. Yeah, it takes a while for something like that. And uh, yeah. it takes a while. And and um, I like to, like the first fermentation, I like to let it go sort of violently, you know, yeah, go through yeah, its really motions. Rapidly. But then the next fermentations, I like them to be slower. So you want to put your cider in a cooler area. Mm -hmm. And I have a friend up in Vermont, uh, Pete, Newton, who has made cider all his life, and he says he actually, like a chef, he'll taste his cider, and then when he decides the flavor is where he wants it, the sweetness, he will take that cider and put it out so it can't, so it doesn't ferment as quickly anymore. Mm -hmm. you know, he'll actually manage the flavor of his cider by how he moves moving his, temperature, moving temperature, yeah, around. temperature. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. And then there's a the whole thing with different yeasts, like you know, you could use a champagne yeast, and then it's going to go right away to dry. Mm -hmm. But, um, so what kind of yeast are you using? I'm not using any right now. So I'm just using you, a natural. You, okay, good. Yeah. And in the the thing comes out of this guy. Well, this Pete Newton and his brother Amos, they make cider and they've lived on this farm all their lives. And and Amos makes a lot of cider and Pete makes a lot of cider and Pete uses, um, Red Star baking yeast. Oh wow! And Amos doesn't use anything. Okay. And which one do you like better? They They're both delicious. <laughs> I love They're hearing delicious. that. I love hearing where somebody uses a baking yeast. Red Star baking <laughs> yeast. That. And I've I've made Red Star baking yeast cider for quite quite a while no too kidding. myself. But, Red Star baking. But this year Holy I decided shit. I was just going to go with the natural fermentation. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Interesting. So um, the only time I use a baking yeast is when I make a tomato wine. Really? Yeah. And you got to use the baking yeast. You can't use any. I try to be more Why high pollutant. That? I don't know why. I do not know why, but you know, I tried it the other way, trying to be a little bit like a wine snob and go back with the base baking yeast. No, your yeast is coming off of your your press. It's coming off, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. I mean a lot of it. The, the yeah. apples itself, but I mean predominantly, it's coming off of your your. Okay, so you, this has got old world terroir now. Yeah, something. you have yeah. old world ter ter terroir, and your and your cider mill here is like what's really impacting your yeast so Interesting. I, i'm wondering where did you get your press what's the history of that well the press the parts from the press we built the press but the parts of the press like the wheels yeah and which is really the only thing we got oh was, okay My came God. from this You're, this guy wow, a friend incredible. of mine jim Mayer in cooleyville he got a press somewhere and it was this it was like it was like 48 by 48 and it had this giant water-powered cylinder that that raised it up like that one raises up yeah and i think it was capable of pressing like a, a 50 gallon barrel in one press okay but yep. um it was all in the woods and it was all rotten and trees were growing through all the parts and we couldn't get the water cylinder part out because there was a big root going through it so we basically ended up with four wheels 
There are originally eight wheels. Yeah, because you'd have a double you'd have a, a double, double tray. You yeah. Could put one in and right, move it. Yeah. So we got four wheels. Uh -huh. I think I got seven wheels. I, we didn't have enough with two trays. But anyway, so we just the the most amazing part of that find was realizing how it worked. Mm. And then we got the wheels, and so we scaled it down to basically thirty inches by thirty inches. So and you you had the wheels, and then you made. What are the wheels rolling on? Is that like a metal runner there? Yeah, there's a metal runner and there's a wooden runner too in some places, but it just they just have to roll back and forth to the pressing station. That's so incredible. And yeah. it's quite heavy when it's loaded, you know. Yeah. You, you can't lift it. It's it's got to be substantial. So Right. <clears throat> yeah, so those wheels were the quintessential part of that press uh, for us. Yeah, and really important. The idea of how they did it too. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Cooleyville over in like Shootsbury. Yeah, Cooleyville. Yeah, <laughs> it's like the, the circle keeps on tightening. <laughs> yeah, I, know, I love I it. Know, Jeez, some crow. Yeah. And, and, That's and, awesome. Uh, uh, did you ever hear this guy in, uh, in uh, was it Williamsburg? His name was Dewey. Dewey. I have one of Dewey's old jugs with you a label do? on it. Yeah. Oh, my God. I saw it was like at this like auction. People didn't know it was, what it was. And I'm like, I need that I need that jug because it's a nice label. It's in good shape. Oh. So. Yeah. So what do you know about Dewey? Well, not much, except that people always mention Dewey around here. So, you know, back when I started getting into cider making in 94, folks were, you know, talking about Dewey. And, and now, since then, I've met so many people who, as kids, would go see him, and he would sell it to kids after school. But it always had, like, a little punch to it, you yeah, know? Yeah. It was supposed to be, like, ciderkin, right? <laughs> not really fermented, but maybe, you know, a little fizzy, so... And would sell it to kids, and then um, he was kind of a bootlegger because he didn't—he wasn't licensed. No, no. But he's like the OG in yeah. in Western Massachusetts for so making cider. I assume cider. he's dead now. Yeah, yeah. He he was out by um, not too far from the reservoir. From Flor in Florence. Florence yeah. yeah. In the late '60s and early '70s, you know, the cider would be in plastic jugs or glass jugs, okay. just gallon jugs, yeah, and people yeah. would buy it i think it was two dollars a gallon and it was kicking stuff man was it fortified do you know i bet it was i were, bet it know, was sugar too because sugar yeah you know but it i remember it was very alcoholic uh, yeah there was <clears throat> one party in shootsbury actually on cooleyville road where a guy was killed driving home from it from dewey cider oh shoot yeah i wonder if that Bruce came scott no kidding huh yeah. wow I wonder if Dewey got in trouble for that because he I don't know if he did he's because but, doing it all under the but table. Yeah, I don't think you know. I think no I don't know. I, I don't think anybody ever followed through. Uh, I mean, when you're drinking, it's your responsibility. You can't blame the cider maker. No, you know you got to control. But well, cider is that was that, that was then though. This is now. Yeah, I you know. You got to blame somebody. I know, everything. right? Yeah. Gotcha. I also remember when we were kids in Shrewsbury, there were <clears throat> several places where, like. On Saturday, you could drive to the house and around back in the garage, they sold booze. So it would be like Jack Daniels or Southern Comfort or maybe some beer. And so, we used to, when we were high school kids, we used to drive around. We knew there were three places in Shootsbury where we could go on a Saturday night and drive around to the garage and pick it up. And we'd buy some, uh, buy some drink at a premium price. So they were buying, you know, it from I don't the remember store. because we didn't really care. Yeah. You know, we were all like putting our money together to buy something. But huh. I mean, like, like that's totally non existent now. <laughs> no, I mean, it is. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Know? It's like, forget your and life. I remember if there you were these that. old people that'd be sitting on the porch, you know, <laughs> and then we'd just come along and you'd be like, oh, yeah, here comes some cash, you know. <laughs> Like I think the old world philosophy was the best the best work scenario is when you stay in one place and people come to you. So like a livery or a blacksmith sure. or a grocer yeah. or a bank. Yeah. And any other job is an itinerant job. Mm -hmm. So as an old person to sit in your house and have a bunch of alcohol and have some kids coming and buy it all the time. That's like top of the food chain. <laughs> hey, man. So well said. <laughs> they it's bring true. you money, and you don't have to go anywhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I did not have that when I was growing up. Um, but what a, what a hoot, because they were selling something that you could buy in the store. So yeah. their market was underage. And back then, it was 18 years old, right? Whew, I guess. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm sure they sold us some local drunks too, but yeah, yeah, we were just learning about drinking. So my goodness, isn't that something? We hadn't developed it. That that the highest skill level yet. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, I love hearing these stories because it's it's kind of quintessential New England, isn't it? Yeah. Where you have this um, these presses mm. in the backyard and people are doing 50 gallons and doing wild ferment and then fortifying it, you know. Um, and you know the thing is, we're we're such a bunch of hypocrites. We really are. The whole culture it's just full of travesty and lying, self deceit. But I read this story of uh, Sarah Porter from the Hunting, Porter Huntington Phelps house. Yeah. In her diaries, she's talking about, like this is 1740, she's talking about her husband's having like some stomach problems. And she's, they've decided that he's going to cut back on the cider that he's drinking. Well, in February, he's not drinking fresh cider, folks. No. And he's drinking every night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so... You know, that's what I'm talking about. Like, But I'm huh. um, reading this really interesting book now called Drunk by this guy, Ron Chernoff. And it's fascinating about how alcohol precedes, the use of alcohol pre, uh, pre, uh, precedes the discovery of agriculture. That the discovery of making something with alcohol in it Sure. turned out to be the original currency which allowed pyramidal power structures so that the person who controlled the alcohol controlled population mm-hmm. and that population became like a workforce mm-hmm. and then that led to the discovery of alcohol of agriculture and of course agriculture enhances the production of alcohol cuz now you can distill it and so forth people were like little family groups that were extremely violent and hostile toward one another because they had to survive. And there was nothing that brought them together until alcohol. Because alcohol is the great kind of... Equalizer? I mean, it, I mean alcohol has problems individually. You know, it's yeah. true. It's not good for you. Right. It makes you... It can make... For some people, it's violence. Yeah. It yeah. makes you do stupid things. Yeah. But as a social tool... For bringing people, to, especially people with a lot of, of hostility, it's the thing that has been present in human culture throughout the world for in, we don't even know how long. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, fruit was fermenting on the ground. Yeah. And then, you know, the deer around here are eating the scraps or the bear come by. It doesn't take a and, rocket scientist yeah. to figure this out. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, it's it's interesting because, you know, alcohol is dangerous. It does cause a lot of problems, but we have uh, sort of a we have sort of a, a really muffled view of what really uh, what really is going on here. I mean, the problem is that, you know, we're a, a very aggressive, competitive species and we're violent and nobody wants to be that. I don't want to be that. Try not to be that. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. That's what you look around, and that's what you see, mm-hmm. and uh, and alcohol has played a role in that. The other thing he says, uh, Chernoff says, is that if you look at every major treaty after every war, every major meeting of diplomat, dip, diplomats, all involves alcohol. Seals Drinking the deal. alcohol seals the to deal. seal the deal. Mm-hmm. And that's he says that if if you are drinking with someone and you make an agreement... That's a very big binding. agreement. It's a binding, binding yeah. agreement because yeah. you made a deal, you know. And yeah, all this time. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of transactions over that. And, w- and we will seal the deal by raising a glass. Raising a glass. Yeah. And so it goes. Uh, before we end this conversation with Phil Watson, I have one more clip that I want to share with you because I think that there's something in here for everyone. And it's from a, a guy who I hope you have a sense has... A, a, a bit of depth to him on how he sees life as trying to forever be a learner, experiencing it, participating in it, sharing it, and having just a zest for the woods. And of course, when, you know, <laughs> really what I kind of found out about this story, I thought I was going out to meet somebody who was like an Apple fanatic, a little bit like I am. But really, it was a man who was 
taking one thing off his bucket list, but having a hell of a good time while he's at it. And that was to build that water wheel that he experienced as a child. So let's roll this clip right now and just hear a a little piece that I hope that each and every one of us can kind of take away to be able to be living our best life. Well, you know, I worked for this old farmer once and and he was, he had five boys and, uh, and they, uh, he was sort of retired, but he was never retired. And the way they decided which boy was going to take over the farm was he and his wife would go on a two week vacation. And this is when the boys are older, you know, like okay, young adults. Yeah. And he would say, okay, you know, Tim, you're in charge of the farm for two weeks. Well, we're gone. And then he would come back. And see and what was done. See how, how it was. And if, you know, the, I don't want to be a farmer, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go to school and be a teacher, you know. Uh-huh. And they did that five times. Five and they boys. had one boy that decided, that's what I want to do. I'm going Smart to farm. man. And he did. And then after a while, he got sick of it. And then the other boy that had decided he didn't want to farm but teach, decided he didn't want to teach anymore, and he took the farm over. But anyway, the point of the story was that I think this guy was a very wise man. And one day when I was working, I was putting a kitchen in their house, and um, he was walking back and forth the dooryard, and he had these big giant boots on all covered with cow shit, you know. And I was walking out. They had like a little shop out there with a little table saw. And I was out working in the shop to work in the house. And I met him walking across the dooryard. And he looked at me and he went, just remember one thing, quality of life. And he just walked on. And it was like, wow. Quality of life. Quality of life. And that's what this whole thing is about. It's like, do you want to just buy something that's pretty? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to taste something? You know, right and it's everything. It's our whole culture, you yeah, know, yeah. like everybody wants to wait until the weekend because, yeah. man, when the weekend comes, you go wow. I'm done with freaking work. Yeah, yeah. It actually turns out work is the weekend. You know what I mean? Like you. I do. I do. You got to live work because you yeah. see this all the time, especially among men when they retire. Mm. Like all of a sudden they're lost. I mean, lost. Huh, huh. So, well, I don't. I don't sense that. That's who you are. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't sense that was, who you are at all. I was raised by a woman. <laughs> okay. So I'm. I got. I got a lot of. I got a lot. Right. I got a lot of. Yeah. I got. Uh, I got some good stuff yeah. from her. know that that farmer surely made an impression on Phil and seeing him in that kind of playhouse water wheel setup he is living his best life there and uh, I, you get a sense of a quality of life to not necessarily say what do I want to do but how do I want to live my life and what is going to allow me to do that if you get to do those questions and get to live your life that way you are one lucky soul and Isn't it amazing where we head out on the Cider Trail, where it brings us to? All I could say is, hello, Season (laughs) 7. Well, I'm going to be rolling out of here uh, at the very tail end. I'm going to put up a different song than the We Like Cider song. But you could always listen to that if you go to the Cider Chat YouTube channel. Uh, There is going to be a playlist, and on the playlist, you'll be able to find that song. And also, this song I'm rolling out right now called Strange Apples. And there's actually a little video I synced up with the song. So if you're into that, check it out at the Cider Chat YouTube channel. It is sung by myself and my cousin, Jay. This is Rhea Wincaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. Strange 
apples Bitter sharp Strange apples Juice and rub Want a tan and bomb. Who wants to pull them down? I'm gonna pull them down. Hey, 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 hey apples, bitter sweet, strange apples hanging high. Got them strange apples. Forget the pie. Strange apples Squeeze them tight Got them strange apples Strange apples Strange apples Make them pop I want a tan and ball. Who wants to pull them down? I'm gonna pull them down. Hey, 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 apples. Come and see. Plenty strange apples for you and me. Strange apples. Strange apples. Yeehaw!